Hello and welcome to the Career Changers. Our guest today is Nicoletta Porogiano, psychologist, therapist, educator, and founder of The Significant You, a mental health charity that provides mental health education and campaign, campaigns to raise awareness and promote individual and collective knowledge of mental health in England and Wales. In Nicoletta words, I struggled in life a lot, probably like you did, and my studies and training did not help much. I remember starting my career feeling completely helpless in my role as a clinical psychologist in a palliative care hospital, working with the dying and, that, and their many regrets, unfulfilled dreams and ruptured relationships left behind. Time passed and despite my clinical work, personal therapy and ongoing training in psychotherapy and counseling, I kept busy and I was still trapped in my program mind when I was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer in my mid forties. What saved me was a profound spiritual awakening I had from the bed of an AA department in London hospital when I nearly died from a chest infection two months into my chemotherapy treatment. Today, Nicoletta is going to talk about her career, spiritual awakening, and the importance of taking responsibility for our mental health during our journey to self-realization. Hi, Nicoletta. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Elisa. It's so great to be here sharing this beautiful space and, and conversation with you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy that you are here, and I wanted to give an introduction to our listeners by using your own words because I think you are, uh, you have a very inspirational story, and hopefully this will help many other people during their journey to self-realization. So let's start with uh, your background. Um, how did you start your professional life, or better, what was your first job? Beautiful question. Well. I had this dream of becoming a psychologist since I was 10 or 11. Um, but then I tried different things before I found the confidence to walk on my path. Um, I've done a little bit of bookkeeping. I didn't like it. It was too, too monotonous for me, really. Then I got a degree in, um, in hospitality, uh, but I gave that up years of studies after three months working in the reception of a hotel. Um, I felt like in a cage. Then I worked for four years um, as a clerk in our uh, local town hall. And then for five years, uh, I've been a journalist. I wrote for our weekly newspaper. Um, and meanwhile, I got my degree in psychology, my MSc in, in community behavior therapy and different other training. And it was, uh, it was fantastic. And then I, I started actually working as a clinical psychologist in palliative care, as you mentioned, and I opened my own practice. And 15 years ago, I decided to relocate to London, where alongside my private practice, my private therapy practice, I managed mental health services. Um, and I've done that until a few years ago. Um, I actually stopped my paid role uh, when I got ill. Um, and for the past few years, I only managed my private therapy practice together with these projects that occupy my time, like the Open Your Happiness podcast and the mental health uh, uh, charity, The Significant You, which are very, very close to my heart. What was your dream job when you were a child? I kind of knew that I'm going to be a psychologist. Uh, my grandmother was a mystical person. Um, she was the healer in the village. I grew up for the first seven years of life with my grandparents at the countryside. And I was pretty privileged to have that experience, uh, free, you know, in the fields, my, myself and my brother, uh, with two wonderful, mature, uh, beautiful souls, people, um, both of them were amazing. And I think seeing my, uh, seeing people coming to my grandmother for advice or for support, for, you know, for a little word, or maybe a potion to help them heal, I don't know what kind of pain, um, or asking advice to my grandfather, who was the sage in the village. He was a very wise man. I think that cemented, in a way, my interest in, in being of service to others, in helping others. So that was my dream job. I wanted to be like them. 
<laughs> oh, what a beautiful story. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned uh, your education, um, but um, you did that uh, after some experiences. So initially, what, what is your educational background? I have formally studied for 30 years, uh, 15 of them uh, at university and postgraduate level, um, studying, taking all sorts of uh, courses really, uh, but mainly psychology, psychotherapy and counseling and some affiliated disciplines. What have been the highlights of your career? I loved every single job that I had and I gave my best to every single job. Although in time, I had to move beyond the limitations of each job, really, because I wanted more. There was this sense of expansion, me searching, seeking for something different. But if I'm to be honest, the five years in journalism have been the best years of my life, of my the best years of my professional life. And if media would be somehow aligned with my values, I would probably still have been a reporter to this day. I wouldn't have left that. Uh, but I am very grateful for that experience. And I feel that um, being a therapist in private practice today is the next be best thing in life, is the next best choice. Um, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm grateful. That's very interesting. Um, yeah, like. Right. We can have uh, so many passion in life, uh, even if then we decide to transition to a new career. And um, and each job, each career can teach us something important that then we can carry with us and make us the person that we are today. So, <laughs> so even if you had a successful career, uh, you felt unresolved and unhappy for a long time. What was the cause of that? I didn't really understand it, uh, despite my studies, my challenges, my life experience, my social experience. But I've learned that our mental programming, it's really what keeps us um, in pain and suffering. Um, you see, I've been through this domestication. Um, the world tried to make me, you know, um, the woman that I had to be. Um, it was, I wasn't allowed to be myself, really. I wasn't, I wasn't encouraged to be myself. I had a family, then the school, and then the culture trying to program me and condition me. So for a long time, I felt stuck in that condition. And, and I felt in a way afraid to free myself from this, from this brainwashing, from these stories that, you know, have been instilled in my mind. And I, I, I felt quite hesitant to create the life that I wanted to create for myself. Um, and I feel that in a way, what kept me a little bit uh, unhappy and struggling was this programming, which is such a strong uh, a sort of software on our brain, really. And, and this is what makes most people to not dare to, to welcome novel ideas and, and oppose the, the status quo, you know, and, and, and and just follow the crowds. So psychologically speaking now, I, I, I feel this is understandable because we all want to belong and we all want to feel included. We all want to feel validated. It's, it's a human need. And of course we want at the same time to be part of something bigger. So we wouldn't isolate ourselves. And that's why the programming is, is just what keeps us all together in a way. It's, it's the, the, this kind of illusion that we all create in the world or it's been created for us and we just join and we stay there until we actually properly awaken. When was the moment that changed everything for you? I had times of awakening since I was probably eight years old. I realized that I was aware of myself, you know, I was I was observing the people around me and I was asking questions about similarities and differences between them. And then there was this sense of presence um, in my life, but it wasn't sustainable. It came and then it left because I kept myself busy all my life. I had these perfectionist tendencies. I was an alcoholic, uh, uh, sorry, an alcoholic. Uh, I don't know where this is coming from because I don't drink. 
I was an alcoholic. Um, and this was my uh, coping mechanism to deal with my childhood trauma. So I would immerse myself into work. And then I always had paid jobs. Um, I had my private therapy practice. I had uh, volunteered for charities. Um, I always studied. I was always involved in a course. And I was actually doing my second uh, master's course uh, when I was diagnosed with uh, triple negative breast cancer. In fact, it was the same day when, when I was diagnosed, um, when I was about to start my third year and final year, when I was about to do my research uh, at Greenwich University. And yeah, and this is uh, obviously when my life, uh, when I was diagnosed with cancer, breast cancer, my life was shaken and it somehow naturally reorganized six months of chemotherapy to major surgeries, years of struggles. A lot of time really to, to, to spend in hospitals, but also a lot of time to think and, and you know, maybe find a little bit more time for self-reflection. And the thought of dying, I think, reshuffled my priorities in life and my perspective to, to this existence. And the key moment and the big awakening, the biggest I had was a couple of months in my chemotherapy treatment. I think you mentioned a little bit on that. When I was, um, I couldn't eat and drink. Uh, I couldn't get out of the bed for three days. I thought I'm dying. I was that poor. And um, I had an unknown chest infection. I ended up in the NE department in the hospital. And whilst I was waiting there, um, I thought these are my last moments. And I went through a lot of... Um, you know, reviewing uh, of the past. And I think that understanding and the acceptance uh, of my circumstances and my condition helped me to finally surrender. So I accepted what was, and I accepted that um, this uh, need to control health and everything in my life is just an illusion. Um, I, I, I kind of transcended my attachment to life and to people that I loved and to objects and to things that I haven't done. In a way, I transcended my uh, ego, really. This program mind is the ego. Um, and I accepted that I might actually walk towards my imminent death. And that was a moment of pure presence. That was a moment of pure conscious awareness. It felt so liberating. I've never experienced anything like this before. Um, and then all of this completely changed how I experienced life. I remained changed inside. It's hard to put it in words, really. And But then not only that I didn't die, but I managed to cure myself, to cure my cancer, cancer. And then eventually I renew my life. I renew myself as a human being. I renew myself as a professional. And of course, I changed the way I work and the way I am with people. Mm -hmm. How and when did you decide to create uh, the civic significant you, the mental health charity that provides mental health education and campaign to raise awareness and promote individual and collective knowledge of mental health in England and Wales? You see, integrating all of these learnings, um, they were significant learnings. And uh, being through all of these challenges, I think it was... It was um, it was a life-changing experience if you look at it uh, um, from distance now, because I I managed to, uh, when I realized that I can actually understand my circumstances and I can accept them and I can let them be, I, I, something beautiful happened in me. I managed to extract meaning from my pain. I, I, I managed to understand and accept that this suffering is here and it's here potentially to stay. And, and then I wanted to learn the lessons. Why is it here? What is this teaching me? Uh, because in a way or another, I've always been in the service of others. And I, I've always loved, you know, being with people and helping people. And and I made it my purpose in life to, to spread goodness and well-being in the world. So And so when when I started to recover from my breast cancer, I felt I felt this strong desire to, to really share with the world all of these learnings that I had and encourage that they struggle maybe like just like me, um, maybe empower those that um, have lost faith in themselves, in people, in everything really, and inspire, you know, all of those people that were on their path of self-discovery, healing and personal growth. So I started to open, um, you know, to happiness myself and 
And then I set up this Open to Happiness podcast to remind people that despite the challenges, they can still remain open to happiness and, and accept when, when a joyful moment comes throughout the pain, throughout the illness, throughout everything. And then naturally I set up this, uh, the Significant Human Mental Health Charity. And I consider them both, the podcast and the charity, a gift to the humanity, my gift to the humanity. Mm -hmm. So each of us with our choices can have a positive impact uh, in the world. How do you feel the significant you is making the world a better place? Mm -hmm. No, this is, this is a lovely question. I feel that um, there is a lot of support coming from the voluntary sector. There's many mental health charities out there. At the Significant You Mental Health Charity, we want to be a different kind of charity. We don't want to be another mental health charity. We consider ourselves a holistic mental health charity, and we aim to empower people to reconnect with their sense of value and significance in the world because we deeply feel, feel without within ourselves, all of us involved there, that everyone is important and everyone matters. So... What we do, we inspire people to consider their well-being in their wholeness, in a holistic way, including the physical, mental, spiritual um, uh, self, together with their relationships with the other people in the world. And um, we do that because we know that uh, relationships are very important and they can bring a lot of conflict and pain in our lives. Then what we do, we, we educate people to open to self-reflection and introspection to get to know themselves because the the source of the pain and the source of the healing is naturally within ourselves. And I, I, we want to always uh, um, um, remind people that mental health is firstly their responsibility, then it becomes the responsibility of the community and the local government. And that's, that's why it's our mission to empower people to live from a place of conscious awareness. We don't want people to, to imagine that they need a therapist or a doctor or someone and without that, they can't be well. They can still do something before they reach to that uh, mental health professional. So I, I, we feel that when when you live a mindful life, um, you know that you have the choice to be well or, or, or unwell. Um, and you have that choice any moment in your life. So everyone can actually choose to live from a place of presence, from a place of love, from kindness, care, compassion, understanding, gratitude, appreciation for life. That's it. It's it's a given to all of us and we can exercise this or not. It's up to us. The Significant You have been uh, running a three-stage uh, mental health campaigns. Uh, what are these three stages and the different message associated? Um, I checked your website, so I've seen that the one is I'm worthy, uh, the second one is my mental health is my responsibility and I have the choice. Yeah, as I mentioned, our mission is to remind people that mental health is a three-tier responsibility. Firstly, the, the, the ability to respond that every single one of us has, and we need to feel empowered uh, uh, and uh, accountable to our mental health. And the second one is the responsibility of the community to treat us with care, with fairness, with, 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 um, um, with kindness. And the third one is the responsibility of the government, obviously, to to create and implement policies that prevent uh, mental illness and, and help us and, and treat mental illness uh, eventually. So our first campaign, I am more the, um, we try to achieve with this to, what we try to achieve is to, to create a strong foundation um, um, in terms of mental health, to inspire people to, to, to really learn about what mental health is about. And to do this, we remind them naturally that they are worthy because much of our pain comes from, from, from this feeling of not being good enough, not having as much as others. There's a lot of comparison and, and, and pressure on performance, really. And uh, everyone is significant and important exactly the way they are. Uh, if they want to work on themselves later on, that's another issue. But to start with, we are good exactly the way we are. And then naturally... Um, we want to make people um, aware that there is support for them. Um, they are not in isolation. They can uh, obviously take care of themselves the best they can, but then they have the choice, uh, a, a, you know, to act uh, and react to life. And uh, the the most important choice is to be consciously aware of what's going on around. 
And when when we live from this, um, when we live a mindful life, when we live from this place of presence and 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 ground grounding ourselves into the present moment, I think it's it's very important to to acknowledge that that's when we are well. Because most of the time, there's no really there's no problem in our lives. It's all in the mind. So the power is inside of every single one of us. Mm, that's beautiful. <laughs> Our career span through our lives, this means that the while is expected from us uh, to be always on top of things, we also have to go through the inevitable challenges that life presents at us. So in your experience, what are the best ways to preserve our careers during our challenging times? Hmm. What comes to my mind is do what you love. Um, remember that you don't you really take with you um, your career. You don't take the titles with you. Uh, none of us does. We don't really take money with us. Money circulate, they get spent. Uh, what we take with us, in my experience, listening to, to many dying patients that I had, um, I think we take our inner experience, uh, which is largely decided by the quality of our relationships. So I would really encourage everyone to make their inner experience pleasant uh, and build uh, and, and grow and maintain beautiful relationships with the other people around and where it's needed, maybe repair the relationships when they get a little bit broken and then live with this um with this feeling that the, the key to, to to lovely and wonderful relationships is in, in the awareness, in this mindful living that I keep repeating over and over again, which is uh, available to every single one of us. It's within our choice. We just need to uh, remind ourselves that we have it. In your experience, what are the most common inner challenges people face in their quest to live happy and successful lives and careers? First one is without doubt stuckness in our program mind. And this comes with all sorts of distorted beliefs about ourselves, about other people, about the world. It also comes with a lot of unhealthy thinking. We know by now from the science that 95% 90, of our thoughts are repetitive, 80% of our thoughts are negative and self-diminishing. So we are trapped in this mind, in the comparison and the performance, the never enough syndrome. And that impacts on the self, that impacts on our sense of confidence, on our self-esteem, on our sense of self-worth. And of course, it creates a very unpleasant mental state inside of us. The second one, I think, is the identification with the physical body. I think, and with the material world as well. We put an extreme focus on the physical appearance, on, on the material goods, on having and, and proving ourselves to others, on things that are measurable. And there's a lot of pretense associated with this. And it's kind of a superficial approach to life, but we will have it because we will share this world and this life. And the third one is the spiritual disconnection because um, very often we are not in touch with our emotions. We are disconnected from our real selves and then we become unable to self-regulate our emotions and our, men and our mental activity from within. And then we obviously we suffer. Mm. So um, you cover a broad uh, uh, different topics, uh, different uh, ways to, to um, help people overcome their uh, limited beliefs, uh, or um, you have a concept that is called proactive positivity. So I want to go through each of these very quickly and to get a yes. quick answer for you. So the first one, if you can give a suggestion on how to overcome limited beliefs, what would you say? Our beliefs shape our mindset, so they are very important. However, beliefs tend to be rather negative and they sabotage our happiness. So it's important to understand that beliefs are limiting us but, and they are very narrow perspective to lives. To believe something that suggests that actually we know we hold the absolute truth and we are not open to knowledge, we are not open to change, to transformation. So we should not really believe in anything. We should just be open to embrace any single idea. I would encourage everyone to replace their beliefs with ideas and remain then very keen to explore different perspectives. 
and live our life from a place of expansion, not constriction and, 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 and somehow limitation. So we don't need beliefs. We just need to play with the ideas because then beliefs run our lives. And, and if they are negative, they will get us in trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, how to handle difficult conversations? It's, it's a difficult task to handle difficult conversation, but it's very possible. I would say enter a state of mindfulness. So bring your awareness to this very moment and remain calm, uh, which is kind of difficult sometimes. Uh, maybe take a, take a few deep breaths. So breath work is very important. Ground yourself into your body and then bring your body, mind and soul together in, in your wholeness. So you are here now. And if you can withhold yourself from, you know, maybe for a few moments, if not more, um, from reacting because when you react you actually react from a place of memory from a place of database from something that you already know um, and that's a learned response that's not your real response so try to avoid that and then when you create you know this time and space to 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 be present you're going to have that room to reason to 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 analyze to consider what's the best way of responding to that it's like Rumi said in his one of his famous uh, quotes. If it's not kind, if it's not uh, uh, necessary, and if it's not um, uh, true, don't say it. So just, just don't say it. Avoid saying it. So it's important to get yourself into a state of response, mature response, not reaction, and then listen to the other. Validate their emotions. Just consider them. You know, Take time for reflection. Aim to reach a mutually satisfactory sort of outcome. Uh, don't, don't feel under pressure to win because this is not a competition. This is just a chat. And then learn from mistakes. And next time, do it better. <laughs> How to cope with uh, fear of missing out? Well, become present and open yourself to the truth. The truth is, Earth is too big for you to walk it all. It's too vast to holiday everywhere. There's too many countries to visit. There's too many cultures to understand. There's too many languages to speak. There's too many restaurants in, you know, to eat in and too many potential jobs or careers that you can pursue. There's too many sports and activities that you could do um, and enjoy. You know, There's too many men or women, according to your preference, to choose from. You're not going to be able to have them all. And there's obviously too many opportunities to experience life. And you can't feed them all in this short existence. It's only let's say a good, I don't know, uh, uh, lifespan would be 80 years or so, that's 30,000 days. They go so quick. So there is no doubt that you will be missing out in this life. There's no doubt. So come to terms with that. Uh, that's the nature of the true reality. And just choose what is possible, what is realistic for you. Listen to your intuition. Listen to your gut feeling. You know, listen to what is what makes you feel aligned with 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 something from, from, from the outside world and be grateful for what you are be grateful for what you do uh, be, be grateful for what you have you know, for your experience Appre appreciate life appreciate what you do what is, it doesn't matter what it is just you know, appreciate your career the way it is do your best every day and then go within yourself because you don't need anyone else and anything to make you happy you just need yourself you just need to go inside uh, so I think this is what you should fear missing out, connecting with your real self, missing out of knowing this. This is what you need to know. This is where you need to visit. This is what you need to explore. Uh, not necessarily something in the outside world. We, we waste a lot of time on, you know, on, on that kind of experience and we neglect the, the inner experience. We don't connect with these beautiful resources that we have inside, with this beautiful uh, uh, reservoir of, of joy and happiness that each of us has and it's available, it's here and now we just need to grab it um, proactive positivity um, we now know from science that um, when we entertain positive thoughts um, or negative thoughts whatever we entertain in our mind actually defines our physical, mental, spiritual health and a positive thought naturally leads to, to an increase in good hormones like serotonin or dopamine. 
And the opposite is true. When you have negative thoughts, naturally you have an increase in cortisol and adrenaline. They kind of poison our body. So if you understand that you cannot control the external world, you can't control the people, the nature, the universe, but you can only control this yourself, your your internal life and your, your life is 100% your making. Yeah, that's when you liberate yourself. That's when you free yourself from this programming, from this ego, from this conditioning. And this is when you step out of this mind, you know, where you struggle to live in peacefulness because that's not designed, it's only designed to keep us safe, not to keep us in joy and, and hope. There's too much worry and too much anxiety there, yeah? So in order to live in peace and positivity, you just need to be in touch with yourself and then you're going to live in harmony, you know, every single second of your life. Peacefulness is within you. You just need to go and get it so you mentioned breath work before uh yes. something that i experienced in my life i'm very interesting uh, can you explain to our listeners what it is and how can uh, um, improve our lives breath work well oxygen is essential to our health it's essential to the, the health of the the cells you know to the organs to the entire body we take to take, we tend to take very shallow breaths uh, right here in the throat. We don't breathe properly, and there's not enough enough oxygen to actually reach our cells. Um, not enough oxygen to be taken uh, from the lungs through the bloodstream back into the body, and of course our cells are starved. Our immune system is not working well. Naturally, our nervous system is suffers because it doesn't have what it needs. In fact, all of this. 11 systems running by themselves in our body will suffer. All of these 79 organs, all of these 50 trillion cells. So naturally, everything that is organized so precisely in this incredible chemical factory will suffer. So the breath work is about taking diaphragmatic breaths. So you breathe to your diaphragm. So you see your belly, you know, up and down. And you, ideally you should breathe using a sequence of four to four. You breathe for four seconds, inhaling through your nose, you hold it for two seconds, and then you exhale, sighing out for another four seconds. And I would encourage everyone to make it uh, like a daily mindful practice. It has changed my life. It's your mindful ritual really, to bring you, see you in, a state of, um, in a state of grounding and presence. And that's the only way uh, to bring yourself in health, you're going to bring all parts of you in health, body, mind, soul. Even your social persona will feel better when you take yourself out in the world. And I promise you, even your relationships will improve. Just do breathing, proper breathing. So we are approaching the end of this episode. Uh, and um, first of all, um, if anyone would like to reach you and get in contact with you well, and how they can find you, they can find me on my website, nicoletaporojano.com. I'm also on some social media channels, not very active because I'm quite busy. But uh, yeah, they can reach me there. They can uh, check my uh, Open to Happiness podcast. Uh, it's on uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, everywhere, really, all, all podcast, uh, podcast directories. And they can also have a look at my uh, uh, mental health charity, The Significant You. We have a team of uh, passionate uh, people wanting to change the way we, we, we offer mental health support. So what type of advice would you give to anyone during the journey to self-realization? Invest in your self-discovery, invest in your well-being, uh, the well-being of your inner world. Avoid stagnation, that's very uh, dangerous. Keep going, you know, just be prepared to adjust yourself to, to the external world and stay connected with your inside world. And now really the last question that we ask to all our guests, if you could give yourself a piece of advice, what would you say to your younger self? I love this. <laughs> Trust your inner guidance. Trust your inner guidance, that's the first. Second, slow down, because I've been, I had a rich life. I. I've been quite intense. <laughs> and the third one, invest in your self-care because at times I put work and different other commitments before my health. And 
you know, I ended up ill. So maybe that could have been prevented. So trust your inner guidance, slow down and invest in yourself care. I would say to myself. Thank you, Nicoletta, for joining us today and sharing your inspirational story and wisdom with our listeners. It was my great pleasure to join you, Elisa. Thank you for the amazing work you're doing. It's been an absolute pleasure and privilege to be here in this space with you and your listeners. And I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. You asked very, very beautiful questions. Thank you. Good health and happiness to everyone. <laughs> Thank you. And the last message for our listeners, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and tune in next week for a new inspirational episode of The Career Changes. Thank you. Bye. Bye.